Something like that. How much serious? I think this is the fifth, fifth year now. Uh, so this is the fourth talk in the series, 2011. And this year the topic is emptiness. So, eight talks about emptiness. There's a short order. Eight talks about nothing. Emptiness is a, 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 usually a Mahayana concept. The Mahayana Buddhism is sometimes referred to as Northern Buddhism, uh, coming from Korea, Japan, Tibet, and some of the Sanskrit traditions in India. Um, but actually we have it in the Theravada, which is the, uh, I might say the original form of Buddhism. Now whether the original is the best is a question uh, we'll leave to another time, but Theravada is the closest that we have to the actual teachings uh, of the Buddha himself. And although we don't come across the idea of emptiness very often, uh, my contention is that all the teachings in Theravada are teachings designed to help you to empty out. So we're not talking about emptiness, we're talking about ways to empty out. Emptying out, what happens? We get to a place, we get to a zone of immediacy, a zone or a point of um, very clear, very sharp, awareness that is very immediate, it's without conceptual thought. Now I've been raising the question of whether athletes and dancers and artists and welders actually enter into this zone when they're, when they're doing something. Uh, when you really hit that spot, when you're, if you're a, say an athlete, a tennis player, you really hit the spot and your body will actually move, if you're returning a serve, your body will actually move before you even see the ball coming towards you. The idea being that seeing the ball is a conceptual action of consciousness. But if the consciousness is still, you're just relying on the unconscious to uh, produce the appropriate action. Now, of course, you need to train yourself to do that beforehand. So it doesn't arise by itself. But this is what we're doing in meditation. We're training ourselves in various exercises. But the exercises that we do in meditation are not meditation itself. So we might count the breaths, for example, or we might watch the breathing, uh, or we might use light as perception or mindfulness of body. All of these are uh, techniques that we're doing is practicing. Like the tennis player will practice, you know, 500 serves, or they practice with a machine, or a boxer will practice throwing. There's only about 12 kinds of um, throws that a boxer can do, and they'll practice them over and over again. There's about 18 defenses against these 12 hits, and a boxer will practice those until the body has learned it and will act that way far faster than the conscious mind can act. When we talk about emptiness, we're not talking about a dullness, a zombie state. When I was younger, I worked with my father, and we'd drive past somebody's house, and this guy used to like to sit on the floor and meditate. I now think he was probably showing off, but at the time I was, I was, I was interested. And I said to my father, what's he doing? And my father said he's meditating, and I said, what's that? And my father said, I don't know, but it's going to be a waste of time. <laughs> 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 and it looks that way, right? It looks that way, that you're sitting there, you're not doing anything. In my father's eyes said, if you're not doing anything, you're wasting time. You should be doing something the whole time. Well, emptiness isn't just not doing anything, it's very vibrant, very awake, very aware. In fact, if you've done very much meditation, you start to get this feeling that the meditation is really life, and regular life is kind of like a delusion. So meditating, you feel like the, before you started meditating, you were living in a real fog. Uh, and that now you've done the ex meditation exercises as these filter through into your regular existence you start to get this sense of much more wakefulness, much more awareness. So this um, uh, emptiness then, uh, it's not like a zombie state, it's not like something that, uh, you know, you're just zzzz. Somebody described it as the dial tone from God, if he hangs up on you, that's and that's all that's left over. It's very awake, very aware, very vibrant. The Buddha described meditation as 
uh, being like a man whose hair or turban is on fire. What happens if your hair is on fire? If you want to know, there's a website called youtube.com and you search for hair on fire. Um, go to Love YouTube, you can find absolutely anything on there. And there's several examples on there of people whose hair have caught on fire, usually with a candle or in various states of inebriation. When your hair catches on fire, you really struggle to put it out. You're not going to waste time, I hope you're not going to get lost in thinking about this or that. There's one thing you have to do, and you have to put out the, the fire on your hair. So I really like this example. The Buddha was saying that the meditation is something very vibrant, very lively, it takes a huge amount of effort and energy. Now you compare that to most meditation teachers these days. They say, make the mind very still, make the mind very calm, be peaceful, and they play nice little tinkling bells in the background to calm you down. So there's a real difference here in the, in the approach to meditation. Emptiness is supposed to be something that's very awake, very sharp, very vibrant. Now it may well be that you need to calm yourself down first. So there's a, a school of thought that says Westerners need calming meditation and Thais need um, vigorous meditation. There's something to be said for this. It's a gross generalization, of course. But generally, Westerners have, you have a lot of stuff going on in your head. So you, you want a method to be able to calm it down a little bit. For many times, they used to go to the temple, and very often they can sit there for hours and hours. The time they actually have this idea that if you just go and be there for the sermon, you get some credit. They call it merit, right? I call it credit. And uh, you get some credit just for being there. We find that a little funny. We think that you actually have to listen um, to, <laughs> to get the merit. Uh, they may be right, I'm sure fact. Um, but the point is that they're very patient. So my own temple in Rajaburi, the abbot would try to rouse people up. He'd talk the entire way through the meditation, giving instructions, with his big booming voice. He has a great voice. Very loud on the loudspeakers, as all the lights turned up to full brightness. And he's trying to stir people up into effort and into energy. So I'm raising this point just to make, uh, make it clear that emptiness is not supposed to be uh, something that's dull, it's not a zombie state that you get into, it's something that's very sharp, very vibrant, and very awake. And how do you get to this zone, Rigan? Because you have this in archery, you have this in dance, you have this in many different lineages. How do you actually get to this zone? First step, by no means the only step, but the first step is you have to empty out all of your concepts, your conceptual thinking. Now, it doesn't mean you, you make yourself stupid, it doesn't mean that you believe people or follow people, you still need to keep your wits about you. But you're emptying out all the concepts. Viewing the world through, through concepts, you create this very fabulous, very fascinating conceptual world. Then, having created this conceptual world, you're looking for ways to solve it, trying to rearrange all of these uh, concepts into some better set of concepts. Concepts are extremely valuable. There was one um, concept I was reading about recently. <clears throat> and as I mentioned in the first week, there's a lot of research done into this. That when you are tackling a difficult concept, and you feel like you've got it, you feel like you've solved it, you actually get a hormonal rush in the body. Uh, so you actually get this physical feedback system that gives you like nicotine or you know, extreme experiences, nicotine or fear or something. You get this hormonal rush that uh, is a biofeedback mechanism that really makes you feel like you've gained something when you sort out any concept. One that I was reading about the other day was quite interesting because I love ridiculous theories. This one was uh, evolution, and I, I don't know any more ridiculous theory than evolution. Mm. And if that statement gets me into trouble, good. And in this particular book, very interesting book, okay, it's talking about the history of the human race. And it's talking about the time when man domesticated the dog. And the question was, did man domesticate the dog? Or did dogs domesticate man? So the first idea is that man comes across the dog and somehow manages to get these wild uh, wolves, dogs, foxes, 
And in fact, all the domesticated dogs come from wolves who are now determined genetically. And silver wolves, whatever they are. He gets them as their babies and tames them, and then they use as guard dogs. And as guard dogs, they warn you when neighboring tribes are coming to attack you. Very male centric, you notice know, all this, there's all men thinking of these theories. And this makes that particular tribe stronger than the, the neighboring tribes, and so they're more successful. This was disproved by genetics, because what they found was that genetically the, the tribes or the areas that domesticated the dog, the dog, which is in Russia by the way, the dog seemed to spread very rapidly amongst all the other genetic groups also. And so it didn't make that particular group better than the other groups. Then the idea is that they, uh, each of the neighboring groups sees that they're domesticated dogs and they do the same, or the dogs get lost and they end up in some other tribe and instead of eating them, they, because the dogs are friendly, they are adopted. This is one theory. It goes on and on. The other theory is that dog domesticated man. That is, changes in the dog's behavior made it more attractive to humans. One idea is that dogs, cats and rabbits and things, because they develop these big baby-like eyes, and you think, oh, they, they look sweet, they're like a little human baby and they're cuddly. So then we look after them. And so that they're more able to eat, they, they get their food. And domesticating humans to feed them is a better survival mechanism than hunting it in the wild. This is the, the alternative theory. And these two groups are battling with each other and arguing with each other. Or well, when you um, have a concept like this, you get caught up in this conceptual world and it starts to get very, very real. Right? You treat these concepts as reality and truth. Uh, in fact, they're just theories, they're just convenience. Uh, constructs or models through which we try to understand the world around us. Uh, in the 1930s, um, there was a craze for what they called the monkey gland craze. And this was basically that as a man gets older, they produce less testosterone. And less testosterone is what causes men to be, to be aging, as men age. And the testosterone lowers, so there's a causal link. So they said, okay, we need to increase the testosterone in men. Give them more verve for life, give them more spirit. <laughs> so, uh, they had this craze for actually taking the testes of monkeys and inserting them into human beings. The funny thing is, to a large degree, it worked, but it was purely placebo. In fact, it, it was rather dangerous inserting these, these foreign bodies into each human body. Uh, but it became like a whole cult and a whole hospital set up to do this. And people reported that they had much more interest in life, much more birth for life, than having these, these transplants, early transplants. At that time, it was thought that glands knew what to do, they knew what to produce. Your adrenal gland knows when to produce adrenaline, your uh, parathyroid knows when to control your salt system, I think it does. The thyroid controls the water system, or something like that. And uh, the idea was that glands knew what to do. Then later they found that that wasn't true, that all the glands in the body are controlled by one master gland, the pituitary gland. Where am I? Pituitary gland doesn't control the system at all. They found out that the hypothalamus controls this system. And the hypothalamus is part of the brain, and the idea that the brain actually controlled the body was, was a revolutionary idea. Probably guessed that we now found out that the hypothalamus doesn't actually control it either because something controls that, and that's the rest of the brain. And the rest of the brain controls it by thought. So, really, it's thoughts, everything comes back to this idea of thoughts and concepts, is controlling your whole world, even your body. Now, the thing with thoughts and concepts is it's very hard to tell when a thought or a concept is real and when it's not real. Uh, because the brain treats both of these exactly the same. Okay. So the thought of something is just the same, it's treated the same in your own mind as the thing itself. It's usually uh, suggested that humans are the only animals that can do this, but um, if you go back to our ubiquitous youtube.com and you google up uh, the sleepwalking dog, that's right. Uh, you'll see videos of this dog that actually acts out its own uh, dreams. And you can see it biting things and running and, and doing all kinds of things. 
and it's acting out these things in its dream. So we know that animals, to some extent, when they're dreaming, they're recreating scenarios and treating them in their mind as if they are real. Maybe conceptual thought is an offshoot of this, an evolutionary adaption uh, from this. What we're actually doing when we're working stuff out, we're dreaming. We're dreaming stuff up, but we're doing it wakefully. Incidentally, the reason when you're dreaming that you don't act out your dreams is because um, it would disturb your sleep. Uh, part of the brain that switches off the connection between thought and the motor neurons. So when you're actually dreaming something, your body doesn't thrash around and react. Uh, people who, whose brains don't do this actually can't sleep. It's a very serious illness. Okay, what happens is this part of the brain turns off the connection between your thoughts and your bodily movements. Um, this is why that if you're mindful, sometimes you wake up and you can't move. Does anybody have this experience? One or two? Not many. Okay. You wake up, usually it happens with people who've done mindfulness, if you've done much meditation, because the mind seems to wake up a little faster than the body does. And what happens is you can't move the body, and that's because the brain has shut down the bodily movements connected to the brain. The reason I'm bringing this up is because in Thailand they have a funny, funny alternative explanation. They say there is a ghost sitting on your chest, and when you wake up you have to wriggle around a little bit, and then it scares the ghost off. And when the ghost goes, then you can be in your body. Uh, it actually feels like that, but I get this experience quite often. It does feel like you're being pinned somehow. So the mind finds it very difficult to tell the difference between um, the thought of something and the thing itself. Because we're living, we live in a world of concepts, and we treat the concepts as if they're real. So, experiments on kids, young children, if you put a block of wood piece of wood with square holes and round holes and star holes and you give them some balls and cubes and some stars. What kids do is they start to put them in, you know, they're trying to put the ball in the square hole, etc. Until eventually they work it out. But as an adult what you do is you play through that in your head and once you've worked it out, you'll sit and look silently at it and once you've worked it out you just make one action and that's it done. Basically, no other animal can do this. A little bit of an argument whether birds can do this is possible. Uh, some birds. Basically, animals can't do this. They can't figure stuff out. Even monkeys or primates that are quite good at this kind of conceptual work, they will tend to actually have to do it first. But once they've done something and it's worked, then they can remember and repeat that action. So this is quite important. We're living in a conceptual world, are living in a world of your own dreams and concepts and ideas. And this is why, when we're getting back to meditation, you really have to be able to empty out this way of seeing the world. Because you see everything through your concepts. Let's jump to a man called Arturo Toscanini. And I think anybody with the word Nini in his name is going to be good fun. And he was a composer. And there's studies done on composers to find out why, not a composer, he's a conductor. And the study was to find out why conductors tend to have long lives. Okay. Now the theory was that a conductor has a real strong cardiovascular workout. When you've seen them, when they're conducting, it's extremely vigorous. They're concentrated, they're in the zone, they're really moving. So they did the brain scans, they did the, the tests on Arturo Toscanini and they found out that, uh, that his, blood, rate would, his blood, would, uh, blood pressure would increase, his heart rate would increase, his adrenal glands would secrete, uh, he'd have this whole raft of um, the sympathetic nervous system firing up in every department of the body, digestion was shut down, um, full flight or, or fight response. But the curious thing about him while they were doing this test was he was only listening to the music. He wasn't actually conducting it. And while he's listening to the music, he's imagining himself conducting that piece of music. And he gets the exact full response, bodily response, that you would get, that you would get if he was actually uh, conducting the music. 
So that's quite interesting. We have these, um, we treat thoughts and concepts as if they are actually real, even to the extent that we have the full physical uh, reactions to those, to those thoughts and concepts. And this conceptual world that we're living, is, living in is a way of um, resentiment. I want to use this word resentiment. And this is the source of the word resentment. And resentment means something that happened in the past and you still feel it. Something that made you angry or, or annoyed in the past or something that you blamed in the past. You re-sentiment the feeling. When you call up the feeling, you're literally going through that same physiological uh, response that you did in the first case. So war veterans have this. Uh, when they hear a loud bang, they're actually re-sentimenting the experiences that they haven't been shot at. And this is why they can, you have all these Gulf War syndromes and you're literally re-sentimenting things just on the basis of concepts, because this concept of conceptual experience treats things as if they're actually real. And when we get back to meditation, we realize that the concepts aren't real. The conceptual world that you're moving in isn't actually real. It is very good for figuring stuff out. So we're not saying that we want to be, <coughs> we shouldn't have developed a system. But we need to develop it further and start to see concepts just as concepts and not re-sentimenting them or treating them as if they're real. Here's an example. I was 22 years old and somebody stole 500 pounds off me and I know who it was. <laughs> and this crops up in my mind from time to time. Usually when I'm annoyed about something and then I, I pull this one out of the bag and I dust it off and I get annoyed about this as well. What I'm doing is I'm re-sentimenting, I'm, I'm re-feeling the sentiments that I had when this particular event, uh, this particular event occurred. I have a choice uh, when this uh, happens, right? I can choose, as I remember this particular event, I can choose whether I'm going to follow it or not follow it. I can choose whether I'm going to treat it as if it's real, and it's not real, it was 20 years ago. So I can choose whether I treat it as real or whether I treat it as a concept that's just arising in the present moment. Okay? That's a very different way of being, right? A very different way of seeing yourself. If you treat it as a concept that's arising in the present moment, you look at it, you're looking at it as an object rather than being drawn into it, rather than as a subject. And then you think, why would I want to think about that stuff again? doesn't make sense. Why would I want to pick, pick that up and start thinking about it again? Right? Ajahn Chah described it in this way. Imagine two chicken farmers, and one goes into the chicken house, and he collects all the chicken shits and brings it into his house. And the other one collects the eggs. Which one is wiser? Ajahn Chah always put things a little bit more directly. <clears throat> so it's the same with the mind. Stuff crops up in the mind because of karma, because of all the weight of emotion and thought that I've given this particular event in the past. Um, because of that weight, gives you the karmic weight, it's going to crop up in my mind at some point or other. Right? If I re-sentiment it, I'm feeding it with more thoughts and emotions. I'm making it stronger and it's more likely to come up again. If I don't feed it with thoughts and emotions, it's not going to come up again for a while and sneak it through the back door. So this is a very different way of, uh, of treating your conceptual world. Rather than getting drawn into the concepts, you're taking a step back and you're treating them just as concepts. And you've got the choice, do you follow them or don't you follow them? Uh, this is what the Buddha called the gatekeeper. He said that mindfulness is like a gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper's only job is to stay on the edge of the city, on the gate of the city. And when somebody good comes along, you let them in. And when somebody a bit Scruffy comes along. Uh, I wasn't looking at you when I said scruffy. I was like, <laughs> Lucky you shaved. <laughs> Lucky you shaved. <laughs> um, and somebody bearded comes along. He didn't let them in if they don't look very trustworthy. That's all the gatekeeper has to do. That's his only job. He doesn't have to worry about tax laws in the city or trade or commerce or setting up laws or crime and punishment. That's his only job, just to be on that gate. Think about it like a bouncer in a nightclub, you know. 
somebody, if you try and get into a nightclub and the bouncer looks you up and down, I'm like, I don't like the look of you, you're not coming in. What do you do? You go around the corner and you turn your jacket inside out, you ruffle your hair up, and you come back with a fake Scottish accent and you try and get in again. <laughs> so it is with all the stuff that karmically you have in your big bag of stuff that you've sentimented in the past, you've fed with thoughts and emotions in the past. They're going to disguise themselves and come back in another form. So that's normal. The gatekeeper doesn't have to worry about that. All that he has to do is, uh, if it's good, let it in. If it's no good, let it in. Simple. And this is the function of mindfulness. This is why I call this talk, taking a moment. Uh, because this action of the present moment is what is crucial. I want you to have a look at this girl over here. And just look and hold the concept the image in your mind, see what happens. Volunteer? You don't know what you're volunteering for, it's like you're a volunteer. Okay. Grace and style. Grace and style. Okay. Now, if you've never done any dancing, you're going to know what kind of pose this is. That's going to be part of your perception. I haven't done any dancing, um, so I'm really you know, just graceful, but I, I couldn't tell you how or why. <coughs> I couldn't tell you what kind of stance this is, or what she's doing. It looks like she's sucking this, this beam out of my head, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody notice that? Oh, not really. Okay. <clears throat> Did you think about the dress, uh, identify the dress? You need a special kind of dress to dance like that, right? Well, the color of the dress, you know, a lady in red has a particular significance, right? Uh, she's young, attractive, Asian. Did they notice these features? I started wondering how long she could hold that pose. Right. <laughs> so kind of like my mind went off. Probably as soon as the camera went, she collapsed. Yeah. Like. But what happens is you can't keep conscious attention still on the image for very long. Quite quickly, you're going to have to start picking particular aspects of the image in order to keep your mind on them. Thinking it or calling into mind those particular aspects is called thinking. And in Buddhism, thinking has a function of throwing the mind, literally throwing the mind, vitaka, throwing the mind. And it's throwing the mind back onto the thing that you've just looked at. Because your mind can't hold anything for very long, for more than a few seconds. So the thinking then throws your mind back onto the topic. And you can't keep that image in mind for very long without starting to identify specifics. And every so often you have to remind yourself, girl, dancing, to get back to the original thing that you were looking at. So, so when you re-sentiment something, when you call something a concept up in the mind, and you call that something like childhood, it has a particular feeling, a particular perception, a particular form, that is, you've used the word childhood. <laughs> Or you use a symbol of something in your childhood, like a childhood toy, to call that idea into your mind. Uh, liking and disliking, and you've got conscious attention. Now, if you're attracted towards that image, be it positive or negative, you then have to start throwing yourselves at aspects of it in order to keep it in your mind. So you start thinking about the things that happened in your childhood. Right? What your parents did to you, and what your parents should have done to you, and what the school bully did to you, and what you did to somebody else, and etc. etc. You have to keep throwing yourself back at it in order to keep resentimenting this idea. Okay. So again, when that image comes up in your mind, you're treating it as if it's actually real. And what's really going on is it's just the one of these five candles, this, this group of perceptions that has arisen in the mind. If you don't re-sentiment, if you don't hook into it, it's going to disappear by itself. This is quite enlightening, this is quite, uh, I find this very empowering, because this means you don't have to solve your childhood. You couldn't, too much stuff going on there, especially if you had a bad childhood. Too much stuff, you can't, re this is why when people think, you think in conversations, you go over and over conversations, right? Mostly, when you're thinking, it's conversing with people. This is called scripting in psychology, you go over these scripts. When you're going over this conversation with somebody in the mind, if you stand back and take a look at it, 
rather than re-sentimenting, rather than being re-involved in it, you're just taking a look at it. You find that you've actually cut out the other person's half of the conversation. You only do your half of the conversation with them. Right? And if you check your mind when you're going, when you're thinking in terms of conversing with people, the other person is standing there glum, shoulders down, accepting the defeat of your fantastic argument. Right? <laughs> They're accepting that you were right. They're never arguing back. When you're scripting, what you're trying to do is you're trying to go back over these particular concepts that you hold. What you're trying to do is fix it. When you're re-scripting or you're going over things from the past, you're trying to fix what happened. Interestingly, this is probably what happens when you're dreaming. This is why dreams go from jump from thing to thing to thing and why Freud thought dreams are so important, because they're trying to pick up and fix all the problems that you had in the past by reliving them as if they were real. But in the dream world, this maybe makes sense, but when you're doing it conceptually, what you're doing is you're increasing the karmic weight of that particular topic. So if you recall your childhood, you're increasing the karmic weight of that topic, making it more likely for childhood to come up into your thinking. You can't solve the childhood, there's too much stuff that goes on there. But what this gatekeeper idea means is that you don't have to. You only have to look in the present moment. If something comes up right now, you can worry about it. Do I follow it? Do I not follow it? That's the end of your involvement in the whole issue. You can let something in if it's good. The concept is going to take you towards generosity, kindness, love, any particular positive mindset you can think, then sure, let it in. If it's something that's going to take you into a negative thing, then don't let it in. That's the end of your job. You don't need to pay therapists all this money <laughs> to figure stuff out. You never figure out your relationship. It's too complicated. Notice on Facebook, when you're filling out the form on Facebook, it says relationship status, single, in a relationship, or married. Then they have to add a fourth category, did you notice this? Single, that? <laughs> Single, in a relationship, married, or it's complicated. <laughs> you can't figure out your relationship. You're not going to be... I mean, to some extent, you can. If you get a therapist and you get some good concepts, and you change, you replace your bad concepts with good concepts, that's good. Uh, this is what cognitive behavioral therapy is. And it does work, and it's good. But in terms of Buddhism, in terms of meditation, you don't have to do that. You only have to look at what's arising right now in the present moment. Is what you're doing or what you're thinking coming from hatred, greed, delusion, anger? Or is it coming from... Is it coming from upstairs? <laughs> uh, you can't solve the relationship, but all you have to do is look in the present moment and see what is actually arising. Where is my action coming from? And fix that. In terms of Buddhism, that's your job. That's all you have to do. And to me, I find this really empowering. Because I don't have to solve my relationship, I only have to look at one very small thing at a time. So when you're doing meditation, for example, when you're doing walking meditation, and an idea pops into your head, and you really want to think about it, you want to re that idea. But it's very small. And when you're looking at it in the present moment, it's not a big deal. When you do things in the present moment, in terms of meditation, what you feel is something arises because of karma, because you put weight into it before, or because something's reminding you of it. And it tries to pull you in. It tries to make you think about it. If you practice with it, and you don't allow the thing to pull you in, what you get is a freedom from that thing. So this is what we're doing in meditation. When in meditation, we have this uh, practice of anything that distracts your attention, you know, hearing, hearing, or listening, listening, or seeing, seeing, or hearing, hearing, and then you bring your attention back to yourself. When you bring your attention back to yourself, you've got an alternative placement for your attention. Your attention can rest at home, bright, very conscious, but not getting consciously absorbed in any object. With everything, there is the aspect of satisfaction. If you turn on a nice piece of music, you're buying into delusion. But that delusion is quite pleasant, right? 
you turn on a piece of bag map and you really enjoy bag maps. Uh, and you get drawn into it. There is a satisfaction in that. And there is a satisfaction with everything in the world. Playing computer games, relationships, there is a, there is a nice aspect to everything. And if you concentrate on the nice aspect of something, you get drawn into it. There is also, uh, this is called the um, asata, asada in the Pali, or asata in the Thai, uh, Thai Pali. Asata means the satisfaction or the attractive element in things. There's another aspect called the adinawa or atino in Thai. And this is the unattractive aspect of things. And everything also has an unattractive aspect. If you think about whether you like something, that liking can actually go either way. I read this list as part of my psychology course. I read this list of, um, of ladies who were um, interviewed when they were getting married and when they were getting divorced. <laughs> One of the things that came out of this was all the qualities that they really loved in the man when they married him were the qualities that they hated in him when they divorced. <laughs> so when they got married, he was frugal with his money. When they got divorced, he was tight fisted. Uh, he was spontaneous, but when they got divorced, he was irresponsible. Uh, he was caring when they got married, he was clingy when they got divorced. Same man, same person, you're just looking at it in a different way. So everything has this aspect, you can look at it in either aspect. Right? When monks ordain, we're given five meditation objects that we're supposed to reflect on. Hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth and skin. And he's supposed to reflect on them as the, uh, in the unattractive aspect. So the hair on the head, her on her head is quite beautiful. Pluck one of her hairs and drop it in your soup and it becomes very unattractive. So what is it? Is the hair beautiful or unattractive or disgusting? Right? Same hair, <laughs> you can see it either way. Uh, teeth. British people, they don't have good teeth apparently. Um, but you can make the teeth nice, the teeth whitening and, and stuff. The nice smile, you know, the teeth look nice when they're in a nice smile. So they can be very attractive. Um, but you have to keep cleaning your teeth, because the teeth is the, the biggest area of bacteria in your whole body. People who floss their teeth live six years longer than people who don't. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> so teeth can be pretty disgusting, right? Look what's on in the Northeast. He has his practice. Uh, you have to go three days without washing, cleaning, or brushing your teeth. Right? <laughs> then you really start to see the disgusting aspect of the human body. Skin, you have to keep it clean, etc. So they give you this is when you ordain, and, and I thought about it, why the nails, head, head, everybody nails, see the skin, and he said you look at it in the un un unattractive aspect. Um, then one day, I was in a very long very, very long ceremonies, all day long thing, Chinese New Year, and I had the job of sitting there receiving these yellow buckets all day long, stinking hot, very humid. I was all in the ceremonial robes, layers and layers of them, I was drenched with sweat, and I was, I was pretty miserable. And then this really beautiful girl comes in, and I was like, wow, she's, this girl is really beautiful, it cheers you up a little bit, right? And then just as I was looking at her, it popped into my head, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth and skin, that is everything you can see on a human being. And you can see it in the attractive aspect or the unattractive aspect. And that's when I suddenly got just how true this teaching is, that you can see absolutely anything in the, as being attractive or as being unattractive. If you pay the attention to the attractive element of something, you will be drawn into resentimenting, you'll be drawn into the conceptualizing around it. Okay? So looking at these nice new Android tablet computers, if you're looking at them on the internet and seeing which makes are coming out, and uh, give my nose a scratch because this is exactly what I was doing, um, what makes they are and their cameras and what they do and how they run, it starts to generate a desire to get one of these computers. If you pay attention to 
computers are a real pain, they cost you money, they don't save you time, and they're hard to work, and they, they, they never work properly, and you have to spend months figuring out how to do everything, then you stop wanting it, right? So you can go either way. It gives you a tremendous amount of power, actually, over your own conceptual world. I bought the computer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't mean you can't enjoy anything. Um, but there's a third aspect, and this was called the Nitsarana, and the Nitsarana is the, uh, it's called the refuge. So when you feel yourself drawn into something, if you don't pay attention to that attractive aspect of it, and remember, you're also attracted to the negative aspects of things, like this man who stole 500 pounds off me, I'm attracted to thinking about him I'm not attracted to the fact that he borrowed, that he stole 500 pounds. I'm attracted to the idea of beating him up in my imagination. So even negative things you can be attracted to. So when this image comes up, these five candles, the, the perception, the feeling, the liking and disliking, the consciousness on it, the form that it takes, the image or the symbol that it's, used, that it's bringing it into mind, I can feel my mind being sucked into it. If I'm really getting sucked into it, I can look at it in a negative aspect and I can feel my mind detaching from it. The Buddha said, if it wasn't for the attractive element of things, beings would not be caught up and deluded in the world. If it wasn't for the unattractive element, element of things, beings would not be able to practice the holy life and realize enlightenment. Then the third one, the sarana, the sarana, nitsarana, is the refuge from it. That means that when I've withdrawn from that concept, there's a point of emptiness, there's a point of stillness. And if you catch that point of stillness, this becomes your refuge. This becomes a different place to place your mind. Rather than replacing one concept with another concept, rather than re-sentimenting, chasing after the details of something, what you're doing is you're coming back to this point of emptiness. You don't have to follow these, these concepts, these, these five candors, as they arise, you don't have to follow after them. There is an alternative place to put your mind. So the Buddha called these three things the satisfaction, the misery, and the escape from things. Uh, escape, I would translate as a refuge, because uh, very much when you get to see this point of refuge, you get to see this point of stillness, and you rest in it, you really get this feeling that Anything that can happen in the world can only happen as one of these concepts that arises in front of you with a form of feeling and thought, etc. Once you see that these five don't actually have that much power over you, it gives you this incredible empowerment that you can deal with anything, even dying, even sickness, even illness, even really devastating things that have happened to you in your life. This is what in Buddhism leads to faith. Faith is not a blind belief in something, faith or sattva is when you really see this point of emptiness and this point of stillness that we're getting back to in meditation. So, that's it. We've got to the end. That's my job done. <laughs>